going to start the afternoon off with Scott Aronson, who's going to tell us about quantum supremacy and its applications. All right. Well, uh, th thank you. It's uh, always great to be back here at Berkeley with uh, uh, old friends and uh, new friends. So. Uh uh, I chose a, a, a provocative or even oxymoronic looking title. Uh, quantum supremacy is the most qu uh, quintessentially definitionally useless thing in the world. And uh, I'll tell you about it and also about applications of it. Okay? Uh, so, you know, and I know that this term supremacy, you know, is getting a lot of pushback and, and complaints and uh, suggestions that we need, we need a better term. Uh, Simon Benjamin recently suggested to me the term quantum inimitability, uh, inability to imitate classically. If you can pronounce that, you're welcome to use that instead. Uh, uh, I also, you know, from, from uh, John Martinez's talk this morning, I got the idea that we should just say this is the, you know, the quantum hello world, which is just hello Hilbert space, right? So. Uh, um, okay, we, we, we could also call it that. Uh, so yeah, so the first part of the talk will be based on joint work with Li Ji Chen, which was at the CCC conference, and the second part of the talk is, uh, is not published yet. Okay, so uh, so what is this uh, quantum supremacy? Uh, so you know the the way that I describe it for uh, years was that you know uh, it is targeting what for me has always been the number one application of quantum computing. Okay, more important certainly than you know uh, optimization, than code breaking, even than quantum simulation, and that is just for you know Gil Kalai and for these other people who come to my blog and say that quantum computing is impossible for them to admit that they were wrong, okay? Uh, um. You know, or you know, or or if if uh, hypothetically they were to turn out to be right, well then that's even more exciting. So you know, uh, 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 great. But you know, we we basically uh, we are trying to you know, uh, I guess for the first time maybe really experimentally test you know uh, uh, whether quantum mechanics violates the extended church Turing thesis, whether it lets us do some task that cannot be efficiently classically simulated, or let's say that is hard to simulate and not merely for reasons of sort of our system being complicated, not being well characterized enough, the constant factors being large, but actually for reasons of asymptotic complexity, you know, arising from the exponentiality of quantum states. Okay, uh, so, um, you know, and, um, you know, what's exciting, uh, as, as, as we all know, is that this might actually be achievable in, uh, 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 well, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I like to say when, when experimentalists tell me one year, I figure, you know, maybe three years, maybe four years, you know, but, you know, but that, but, but uh, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't translate to infinity years, right? So it's, uh, you know, in some, in some uh, out of one years, right, that, you know, maybe, you know, you know, we will have, we will have 72 Qubit uh, chips, uh, uh, you know, or we'll have, you know, either in superconducting, may, you know, conceivably also in, in, in trapped ions, uh, uh, and you know, that, that, that will really be fully programmable, and we could do things like put random quantum circuits on them. Okay, and you know, I would always say at the beginnings of my talks, obviously, this is not, you know, this is completely useless for anything other than proving the point that you know, quantum gives you a speed up, but you know. But that, that's the main thing I care about anyway. So, uh, so let's just try to, try to achieve this milestone. You know, and then after that, worry about you know, doing something that's useful. All right, so, um, uh, so, so if, if this is your goal, uh, you know, to, uh, to just demonstrate you, know, you can solve something that is, you know, let's say we're as confident as possible is classically hard, then something that, that uh, many of us realized uh, around a decade ago is that there are a lot of advantages to switching from uh, decision problems, say, you know, problems with a single right answer, the, you know, tr traditional thing we talk about in complexity theory, to sampling problems, okay, or problems with, you know, many possible right answers, or let's say where the goal is just to output a sample, you know, either exactly or, or approximately from some target probability distribution. 
Okay. Uh, so, I, so actually, the the uh, the roots of this go back to uh, work in 2004 by uh, Tarhall and De Vincenzo. Uh, the sort of modern renaissance of this that sort of connected the you know the hardness of these sampling problems to the. Uh, belief that the polynomial hierarchy is infinite. I guess, you know, that was done independently by Bremner, Joza, and Shepard with their IQP model, also by me and Alex Arkhipov uh, with boson sampling. And since then, we've uh, discovered many other models uh, where, you know, what are the, the advantages uh, of, of these types of things? Uh, uh, first of all, you know, we again and again find that uh, we can solve these hard sampling problems using devices that may fall short short of being universal quantum computers, right? So they are not BQP complete, okay? In many cases, they're not even universal for classical computing, right? They just do this very limited sampling task, and yet it is something that we can argue is classically hard, okay? And, and actually, the second point is, you know, if you just, if all you care about is confidence that a task is classically hard, I think that, you know, at least for exact sampling problems, uh, we can be much more confident that those are classically hard than we are that factoring, for example, is classically hard. Right, uh, you know, I like to say if there's a fast classical factoring algorithm, well, you know, that would that would uh, collapse much of the world's digital economy. But as far as we know, it would not collapse the polynomial hierarchy, right? Which to a which to a complexity theorist is the much more impressive collapse. Okay, so. Um, so, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to go through the arguments uh, about, you know, why these, you know, a fast classical algorithm to solve the, these exact sampling problems, you know, would collapse the polynomial hierarchy. First of all, because, you know, I mean, I mean, many of you have already uh, already have already seen them, and for those who haven't, it's not going to be very relevant for for for, for this talk. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the bottom line is that, you know, we can get evidence that these sampling problems are hard uh, based on very extremely basic conjectures in complexity theory, right? Uh, uh, you know, like uh, really fundamental kind of structural things. Uh, and furthermore, you know, with, you know, we could, uh, hopefully solve these problems with near future technologies like you know noisy intermediate scale or NISC quantum computers to use John Preskill's term okay uh, you know merely we give up you know I, I uh, thought you know uh, at least you know until uh, some months ago on any practical applications of any of this and uh, and also you know it's not obvious how to uh, uh, easily verify the results that seems to uh, require doing an exponential time classical computation, and we'll, we'll come back to that point later. Okay, so let me just jump straight to, uh, you know, the particular instance of, you know, these uh, uh, sampling-based quantum supremacy that, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping will be done in, in, in L of one years in the future, uh, which is uh, uh, sort of sampling the output distributions of random quantum circuits, okay? And this is, you know, the, uh, uh, as you heard this morning in uh, John Martinez's talk, you know, the group at Google is, uh, uh, you know, has, has set this as a goal, and you know, I hope uh, um, 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 others will, uh, will also try this. Uh, the basic idea is, you know, we generate a quantum circuit at random from some natural ensemble. We won't worry too much about the details, but uh, for example, if our qubits were arranged in a, a 2D lattice of size square root of n by square root of n, then we could imagine, you know, what is natural to that architecture is to look at spatially uh, uh, local, you know, nearest neighbor uh, two qubit gates. So we would imagine just having a whole bunch of layers of those gates that we choose randomly from some set. Uh, we arrange them in some number of layers. How many layers? Well, clearly we need enough layers that every qubit can influence every other one. So at least square root of n of them. You know, beyond that, probably the more the better. Okay, but you know, we'll we'll come back later to the uh, relation between the number of layers and the difficulty of simulating the thing classically. Right, the number of layers you can do will, of course, be determined by the uh, coherence of your qubits and the, and the fidelity of your gates. Okay. Uh, okay. And so, so you pick a, a circuit, you know, of a suitable depth at random, you know, and then we fix it, 
let's say, okay? And then we imagine taking that circuit, applying it to the all zero initial state, uh, uh, and then just measuring the result in the, uh, you know, each qubit in the zero one basis. Now that gives us a sample from some probability distribution over n bit strings, right? Uh, uh, you know, in principle, we could repeat this over and over and get many samples from the same distribution. Okay, so so imagine that we do that, right? We get let's say t independent samples from this distribution x1 up to xt, uh, and as uh, John uh, stressed this morning, this distribution is not the uniform distribution. That's that's easy to sample from. Okay, it uh, is a distribution with a very large entropy, but not maximal entropy. Right? Uh, it has little bumps in it uh, because of you know quantum interference. Right? Some outcomes are somewhat likelier than others. Okay, and those bumps are really the thing that we're going to be looking for. Okay, now, you know, a common misconception is that, well, you would have to repeat the experiment an exponential number of times in order to, you know, characterize this whole distribution. In fact, you don't need to do that. Um, you can just repeat the experiment uh, a small number of times. Let's say, you know, let t be O of 1, right? So just collect a fairly small number of samples. And then the idea is that we'll, we'll apply some sort of statistical test to check whether those samples are consistent with being drawn from our hard distribution. Three. But the distribution that you're basically assuming is the Haar random unit? Well, it's not Haar random. It is the output distribution of this circuit C, right? And in fact, it can't be Haar random because C is a polynomial size circuit. In many important respects, it is like a Haar random distribution, and you know, we, we often use that fact. Yeah. So uh, I think actually Dorit's question is equivalent to mine. Bill. All right. Ask. All right. Just to be clear, it's the same thing as a randomly chosen point in the simplex of distributions on two to the n. Uh, Just no. My, so my answer will be the same as my answer to Dorit. Uh, it is not Haar random because it is the output distribution of this circuit C, which has polynomial size. We don't have nearly enough gates to have reached a random point in the simplex. Ansatz. All right. Say, yeah. We think is an ansatz that it'll behave similarly to a randomly uh, chosen point with just with yes in in. In many respects, such as the distribution of the histogram of probabilities, the answer is yes. It will behave like that. Uh, you know, in, in some cases, uh, uh, we've actually been able to prove that. And even you know, for, the, for the statements of that form that we can't prove, uh, we know it by way of MATLAB. OK? So. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Euclidean measure. OK. Automated Euclidean measure. Just, just flat, flat. Random in the sense of Euclidean geometry. You threw a dart at the simplex. Uh, well, it 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 acts like it acts like that in many respects. Yes, but uh, uh, yes. Okay. Not the probability distribution for this particular circuit. Right? No, no, no. The prob for, right for the particular circuit C. It's just a single distribution D sub C. As we would vary over all the possible C's of the appropriate size, we get a whole collection of distributions. This, you know, collection of distributions can be analogized in some ways to the Haar measure over distributions, or sorry, the, the, a random point on the probability simplex, rather, okay? Uh, but, you know, but, but, it's, but it's clearly not that. It doesn't have enough, nearly enough parameters to be that. Okay, okay, so now let me explain what you do, okay? So you take these samples, which, you know, which there might be a fairly small number, say a thousand or, or something, and uh, we, all we do is we check whether they solve some, you know, uh, uh, whether they pass some test. So for the computer scientists, you can think of it as we are asking, you know, do they solve some relational problem, right? Do they satisfy some relation? And the relation will have to do with these x sub i's that we saw uh, being assigned a large, you know, most of them being assigned large probabilities <coughs> by this distribution d sub c. Okay, so uh, Li Ji Chen and I called this the heavy output generation or hog problem. 
Okay, uh, the, you know, so so an, an example. Uh, so. Um, what the Google group prefers to use is a, a test involving cross-entropy. Uh, I think that, that also works fine for, for what I'm going to talk about here. Okay, uh, 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 the type of test that is uh, uh, simpler to think about for our purposes is just some kind of thresholding test where, uh, for example, we could ask, you know, do at least two-thirds of these excites have a greater than median probability, like probability greater than natural log 2 over 2 to the n? Okay, uh, or you know, you could also look at the sum of all the probabilities of these and ask, is it at least uh, uh, t over two to the n times some constant, like you know, one point five or something? Okay, yeah. Is t the same for each of the samples x one through x t? Yes, it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could also vary it and then all, again do a test involving like just all of them together, you know, each one with its distribution. Right, that would also make sense. But for now, I'm just assuming it's the same circuit each time. Okay. Yeah. These tests can be done if you know the probability. So all right. it's simulatable. And uh, when you get to a bigger quantum computer, then that's right. So this is this is very much a test that is designed, as I said, for NISC quantum computers. Okay. Uh, you know, with let's so so the, so the, this classical verification, you'll notice that well, I wrote it right here. It takes exponential time to do it with your classical computer, which means you know, yeah, you could do it with you know 60 qubits, you know, even 70 qubits, right? With you know, according to the recent Alibaba paper, anyway. What? All right. Okay, well, let's say with 60. Uh, 48. 48? Well, you know, it depends how much you're willing to spend, right? But, I, I'm saying what we will probably do at Google and oh. spend a lot of computation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, so 48. Okay, all right, fine. So, you know, you go, go up to the largest number such that you can still do verification. Um, you know, but the, the point is that the ver verification can be done but it is expensive. Okay, you can see that you know it takes you days to do it, whereas the actual sampling process, hopefully, you know, was done in a very small fraction of a second. Okay, so and, and, and it's kind of that difference that we're that we're interested in here. Okay, but it is true that we do not know for these types of experiments, we do not know a polynomial time classical algorithm to verify the results. I mean, you know, in, in principle, there are ways to do such things. You know, once you've built a more powerful quantum computer with fault tolerance and so forth. But you know, we uh, it is a it is a fantastic problem how you do that in the NISC era. So, okay, and then, you know, you publish your circuit, you challenge skeptics to generate samples passing uh, your test in a reasonable amount of time. You know, now, you know, of course, you, you could just do that, have it be purely empirical, but, you know, as complexity theorists, we would like to do better than, you know, than saying, you know, you know, we'd like to say something more about this than, you know, I don't know, seems hard to me, right? So, you know, so that's, um, <laughs> okay, so, uh, so look, so this is this is what the distribution looks like, right? We already talked about this, right? That the the distribution looks like a ran, you know a random point on the probability simplex in the sense that uh, the um, the number of probabilities, you know, the number of outputs that have probability, say at least b times uh, two to the n, goes like e to the minus b. Right, that's an e to the minus b fraction of the of the outputs. Okay, and so, but you're never going to see anything with probability zero. So if you look at what I should actually be observing, if the experiment is done correctly, the probability should be distributed like this. Right? If I was just sampling completely at random, then the probabilities would be distributed like that. Right? And we could, you know. We can do statistics to see the difference between these things. We can look for the speckle pattern, as, uh, 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 as, as, as John puts it. Okay, so now, you know, under what sort of assumption can we actually show that this is a hard problem for a classical computer, right? Well, notice, you know, we, 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 we're asking for something strong, okay? We want to speak, say, uh, first of all, you know, not merely that it is hard to exactly sample from this probability distribution, right? If we just wanted that, then that's, you know, we, we, we know how to do that. 
right? We, we, we know the tools for arguing that, okay? We like to say at a minimum that it is hard to even, for a classical computer, to even approximately sample from that distribution, right? Already there, um, we know that you have to stick your neck out and make stronger conjectures um, um, uh, at present. Uh, that's what Arkhipov and I had to do with boson sampling. That is uh, also what Bremner, Joza, and Shepard had to do with the IQP model. Uh, right, so that already requires a stronger conjecture. But here we want something stronger still. Okay, we want that uh, for a classical adversary, it is hard for them to do anything whatsoever that solves the hog problem. Okay, that passes that statistical test, regardless of whether they're actually sampling from approximately the right distribution. Okay, so you know, so you know, no matter what they're doing, right? Even if it's deterministic, they should just not be able to pass this test. We want to make that empirical statement, right? So, all right, so to we can get that, you know, if you know, if you'll give us a suitably strong hardness assumption. Right, you know, it's always like that, right? You can get any conclusion you want if you make a strong enough assumption, okay? But, you know, but this will not be tautological, okay, be a quite, because, the, you know, the, this assumption will not talk about the hardness of a sampling problem or a relation problem, okay? It will just say, assume that there is no polynomial time classical algorithm that given a random quantum circuit, let's say with n qubits and with m gates, m being large compared to n, which turns out to be very important here, you know, that it will guess with like a, a, a bias even slightly better than random whether a given output amplitude of this circuit is like larger or smaller than say the median of all the amplitudes, okay? That is our assumption, okay? That you can't even do this with two to the minus n, better uh, probability than random guessing, n being the number of qubits. Okay, now, you know, this is a little bit on the edge, this conjecture, right? And a way to, and a, and a way to see that is that there is actually uh, a polytime classical algorithm that guesses whether an amplitude is large or small with this bias over random guessing. One over uh, exponential in M, the number of gates. Okay, this is why I said the number of gates has to be large compared to the number of qubits. Okay, the way to do this is just to write the amplitude you care about as a Feynman sum, you know, sum of lots of contributions, and then just sample some of them randomly. Did you want your omega in the exponent? Uh, no, this is, this, the, the, uh, this is good, this will work. This is good. Well, this is good. Yeah, this is good. Okay. Okay, so then, you know, a theorem that one can prove or observe, let's say, is, you know, if you assume that strong hardness assumption, then, you know, uh, given a random quantum circuit C, there's no polytime classical algorithm that even passes our statistical test with high probability. Okay, the proof, well, I can fully put it on this slide, you know, it's a reduction. Okay, the basic idea of the reduction is, well, you know, suppose that you had a polytime classical algorithm that passed our test, that solved the hog problem with a high probability, uh, then, you know, we could use this to derive a guessing algorithm, because we could just run the sampling procedure and see does it output the you know, the output that, we're, that we care about. You know, if it does, then we guess, okay, so maybe it had a larger amplitude. And if not, we guess, okay, maybe it had a smaller amplitude. Now, that's a really bad guessing algorithm. In fact, it only gives you uh, a uh, bias of like one over exponential and n, better than random guessing, but that is enough to refute the strong hardness assumption. So, you know, given the assumption, yeah, this kind of problem is gonna be hard. Okay, now I should mention, you know, of course we would like hardness of random circuit sampling based on weaker complexity assumptions. Uh, there's a very nice recent uh, progress in this direction by uh, Adam Boland et al. Uh, in this paper. Is there going to be a talk about this later in the, the conference? Uh, but, uh, you know, but basically they've, they've sh what? Oh, lightning talk. So they've shown that the complexity situation for random circuit sampling is sort of at least as good as it is for boson sampling, essentially, right? They've shown that uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, to compute, a, to exactly compute a random amplitude in a random quantum circuit is a sharp p hard problem. 
Okay, now to really get the, start getting the conclusions we want, you would need it to approximate a random amplitude and a random quantum circuit is sharp be hard. And that kind of statement, we just don't know how to prove yet, neither with boson sampling nor with random quantum circuits. But at least we have kind of parity between the two models now uh, because of this work. Okay, so then you know the other thing we did is, uh, Aligi and I, is that we made a good faith effort to try to refute our strong hardness assumption. You know, trust me. Okay, we said, you know, what are you know what are actually the best classical algorithms for just simulating a general quantum circuit with n qubits and m gates? You might think that was a question that must have been studied to death, you know, 20 plus years ago. Okay, but we noticed something that actually uh, was uh, not known, as far as we know about this question. Okay, which is, you know, there are two very different ways to simulate a quantum circuit classically. There's first what I'll call the Schrodinger approach, okay, which is just you store the whole wave function in memory. So that takes lots and lots of memory, but the amount of time is not much worse than the memory, right? Two to the n time, two to the n memory, let's say. Okay, just do matrix vector multiplies. Okay, second approach I'll call the Feynman approach. Okay, and this is you just calculate the amplitude you care about by summing over all the contributions to it. Now this approach is much, much better in terms of memory usage. In fact, uses only a linear amount of memory, but the time that it needs is now exponential in m, the number of gates, rather than n, the number of qubits, okay? And that difference could be enormous in the, in the regime we're talking about, right? You know, you like, you, you know, if you're Google, you can do two to the 50, Apparently, but you know, but uh, I'm gonna stick my neck out and say not even Google can do two to the thousand. Okay, that's more. That that is more than a Google, so to speak. Okay, all right. So so uh, so you know so, so so then this raised an immediate question, which is: Is there a simulation algorithm that achieves the best of both worlds? That is, that uses small memory but also time that is merely exponential in n, the number of qubits. Okay. And what we found is that there almost is such an algorithm, okay? So, you know, uh, uh, if I have a quantum circuit, say with n qubits and d gates, or even d layers of gates, you know, so so stronger, okay, then I can compute uh, whichever transition amplitude I want with uh, polynomial, and act is actually linear in N and D memory, so as good memory as the Feynman approach, and time, which is like D to the L of N. Okay, the number of le the depth to the power of the number of qubits. Okay, uh, and um, and and furthermore, you can smoothly interpolate between this algorithm and the Schrodinger algorithm, right? So basically, with every uh, halving of the uh, uh, so starting with the Schrodinger algorithm, let's say for every halving of the memory that you have available, you can multiply the running time by a factor of d and still simulate the thing. Okay. And the proof of it, well, for anyone who uh, knows classical complexity theory, the proof is just Savage's theorem, okay? It is a recursive divide and conquer approach. I, we take our quantum circuit, just split it into two sub-circuits, say with D over two layers uh, each, and then we can take our amplitude and we can rewrite it like this, right? This is just a rewriting, okay? And then we recurse on these guys, and we keep going. You know, I'm, I'm almost, you know, embarrassed to present something so simple, okay? But that's, that, that, that is what it is, okay? And we, you know, we uh, do recursion, we, we, you know, we keep reusing the same memory, you know, and then we, we, we show that, yeah, you can do better even if your circuit is nearest neighbor by using tensor network-like methods. You can take advantage of that. Um, Okay, but this algorithm, you know, uh, uh, you know, is sort of worth knowing about, though it is, it still does not falsify our strong hardness assumption. Why not? Uh, well, because uh, in order to uh, falsify that, you know, you need to guess a particular, you know, an amplitude with like better, you know, than chance probability, right? And so you really want your amplitude written as a simple sum of exponentially many contributions, right? But this doesn't do that. This writes your amplitude as a sum of products of sums of products of and so forth, right? In order to get this efficiency, it has to be more complicated. And so it doesn't seem to lead to the guessing algorithm that would, that would falsify that uh, SHA, 
Okay. Uh, by the way, another thing I should mention is that this type of ar you know the type of argument that we made uh, for random circuit sampling uh, does not work for boson sampling or for the IQP model. And the reason is that with those models, there is not a parameter analogous to the number of gates that you can just keep increasing, you know, larger and larger, and that sort of controls your you know advantage over random guessing, right? Uh, uh, you know, so, 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 so there is something, you know, special about having a sort of a more general kind of quantum circuit for this argument. Yeah. What's the difference between this and the Feynman version? Well, because, because this, instead of just writing a sum of exponentially many terms, we write it as a sum of products of two things, and then we recursively evaluate these. Okay? And so we get a savings in time. You know, again, the Feynman approach used 4 to the m time. This is using d to the O of n, right? So you can see that they must be different because you know, running time's different. Okay. Okay. So you know, uh, uh, what about errors? You know, of course, you know, you know, you have to imagine that you'll have you know some bit flip errors. You know, a good heuristic is that if we had like k errors, the variation distance between the distribution that we'll be sampling and the uniform distribution which you know, is something that we don't want, uh, will decrease by a factor that is exponential in k. Right? You know, what that means in practice is that you, know, you could handle one bit flip error, probably two bit flip errors. You know, beyond that, it already starts getting dicey. Right? So you know, uh, from discussions with the Google people, I know that they are well aware of you know, just how demanding a uh, technological requirement this is you know, to get the error rate that low, where of course we don't yet have error correction uh, to help us do it. And you know, it will come down to numbers you know, uh, as to you know, uh, how well this can be achieved. Um, OK, so then, as I said, the verification needs to be difficult but not impossible, analogous to Bitcoin mining, you might say. Um, you know, there are some nice recent papers, but Pednault et al. from IBM, Chen et al. from Alibaba. OK, actually, uh, uh, John tells me that uh, uh, who doesn't believe this. We can maybe have a discussion about it later. But in any case, what I, what I wanted to say is that the ability to simulate these kinds of you know, numbers of qubits is uh, not only does it not sort of refute what we're trying to do, you have to be able to do it in order to do it, what, what we want to do, right? Again, the classical simulation has to be possible you know, because we need it for the verification. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, you know, it just has to be much less efficient than doing the actual quantum sampling. Okay, so having explained that, hopefully, I, I never, you know, will we'll, we'll hear again someone, you know, saying, "Oh, you know, this this paper came out showing you can simulate this this, this thing classically, and therefore uh, quantum sampling-based quantum supremacy is a sham." Okay, I expect I'm never going to hear that again. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so let me just in a in a in a final part of the talk, um, but, you know. Okay, so so obviously these experiments are completely useless. You know, as I said in talks for years and years, because all they do is just give you a whole bunch of bits that, if the experiment works, are based are almost completely random, right? And who needs you know like that? And who you know these actually come from random.org. Okay, you know, but you know, who, 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 you know, but who, who needs a bunch of random bits? All right, well, you know, uh, then, you know, it, it actually uh, uh, occurred to some people that uh, actually there are people who, who, who need random bits, and, then, and that can be useful, okay, uh, to have, you know, to actually have a sort of cryptographically certified randomness, right? And there are sort of two types of uses of this. If randomness is secret, known only to you, or only to you and your friend, then you can use it for cryptographic private keys. And in fact, you need, you know, you better have randomness if you're generating uh, cryptographic keys. Okay, but all, there are also many uses for public randomness, which would, could just be announced over the internet and known to everybody. Okay, the obvious example would be a lottery, right? Also deciding which precincts to audit in an election. Uh, also, you know, the, uh, setting the parameters for crypto systems, you know, in a way that everyone can believe that they were not backdoored. Uh, various zero knowledge protocols need public randomness. And then, you know, the proof of stake cryptocurrencies, so the ones that are trying to, 
you know, get the advantages of Bitcoin without using like 1% of the world's electricity, right? You know, one of the ways that, you know, one of the ideas for doing it is that, you know, each time, you know, whenever each, each uh, coin that you have gives you the right to enter a lottery to add a new block to the blockchain. Okay, but then you have to run this lottery in a way that everyone agrees is secure. Okay, so you might say that this problem is trivial to solve uh, quantumly. Here's a quantum circuit that solves it, right? Hope you agree. The output of this circuit is a random bit, right? Or you know, uh, or take a, like just some radioactive, you know, uh, uh, you know, some nuclear material, uh, uh, you know, that you you got from Kim Jong or whatever, and you know, and put some, you know, and, and have a Geiger counter, right? Uh, okay, but the problem is, well, what if your hardware was backdoored? <laughs> Right, uh, so so we, we we know we would like, as we were discussing yesterday, a device independent source of randomness, meaning that uh, we would like uh, some way of generating random bits where you don't have to trust anything about the construction of the hardware. Right, the hardware could have been designed by your worst enemy. You're just going to submit challenges to the hardware, get responses back, and then verify those responses. And the only part you're going to, you know, you'll need to trust is a deterministic classical computation that will verify the responses. Okay, that can obviously never be backdoored by anything. So, you know, it's fine to trust that. Uh, all right, so, you know, so this is actually a research direction that was, you know, pursued in a sequence of beautiful works over the last decade. And people basically figured out how to get, you know, sort of certified randomness generation using experiments that violate the Bell inequality. Right. Uh, so, you know, this uh, line was initiated by Kullback and Renner uh, uh, and then uh, continued by Peronio et al., Vazirani and Vidic, Kudrin and Yuan, Miller and Xi, large fraction of them here. OK. And uh, the um, so, so the basic idea is, you know, you have Alice and Bob play the CHSH game over and over. You assume that they're unable to communicate with each other, but they do share entanglement. And then, you know, if they're able to win the CHSH game, you know, with probability bounded above three quarters, then we can conclude more than just that, you know, well, they must have had entanglement. That, you know, that we, we, we know that in some sense, you know, they could not have known their outputs in advance, right? There must be real entropy in their outputs, okay? Because otherwise, to coordinate everything would have required faster than light communication, right? Which we've assumed that, you know, they don't have. Or you know, or communication at any rate between them. Okay, so uh, you know, so you need a, a, a small initial investment of randomness to just generate the challenges to send to them. But the culmination of this work was to show that with you know even just a very very small initial seed, you can get a sort of an, un, an unlimited expansion in the number of random bits that you have. So let's say you start with 10,000 random bits, you know, that you got from somewhere, I don't know where, but then you can expand them to get as many additional random bits as you want. Okay? So this doesn't even need a quantum computer. It can be done with current technology, although by current, well, to, to really do it honestly, you should use loophole-free Bell violations, which, you know, have only been achieved a couple years ago and are not so easy. Right? Um, on the other hand, you know, you, you know, maybe this doesn't work so well for getting randomness over the internet because, uh, you know, if, if, if you're just downloading these numbers from NIST or something, well, how do you know that Alice and Bob were incommunicado, right? How do you know that the devices were separated? In fact, there is a thing called the NIST randomness beacon that gives the world 512 fresh random bits every uh, minute. Okay, and you can go there, and apparently they are partly being generated using Bell experiments right now, but the devices are not separated nearly far enough as, as we would need for uh, cryptographic security. Okay, but you know, even if they were, how would you know? Okay, so now you know the new idea is well, you could get certified randomness by using quantum supremacy experiments, including on NISC devices. 
Okay, and so you know the idea is you know we start with a small seed on our classical computer, then we pseudo randomly expand it to this much larger set of challenges, like a bunch of challenge circuits. Uh, the classical skeptic, you know, classical so let's say client submits these challenge circuits one at a time to the quantum computer, and um, you know the quantum computer has to return samples from the output distributions of each of these circuits. Uh, and, and the key argument that we make is basically that, well, look, you know, uh, uh, a quantum computer can do this, of course. It can sample the output distributions of these circuits. But if it is doing it fast, then um, under plausible complexity assumptions, it can only do it by sampling. Right? There is no deterministic algorithm, you know, even with a quantum computer, that will generate plausible looking samples from this distribution and do it fast. Right? And so this is a type of statement that, again, if you grant me a strong enough complexity assumption, then I can, then, 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 then I can prove such a statement. Okay? Um, so the upside is this requires only a single device. So you know, good for uh, 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 you know doing over the internet, and it's very well suited to NISC devices because basically, as soon as you have sampling-based quantum supremacy, then you can also do this, right? The technological requirement for doing this is nothing additional to just doing sampling-based quantum supremacy at all. Okay, uh, but you know we do need hardness assumptions. We do need initial seed randomness, and a big downside of this scheme is that the classical verification again you have to check that the hog problem is being solved, and that takes two to the n time classically, which is why you know let's say we want n to be fifty or something like that. Okay, so you know we could you know get private randomness, we could get public randomness. Uh, some people might complain. Well, if the challenges are pseudo random, then we must have a pseudo random generator that we already believe in. And if we have that, well, then who cares about getting true randomness, right? Uh, it's like a, 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 a it seems circular. Okay, but there's a few uh, uh, nice advantages that we get. For example, forward secrecy. Even if the PRG were to be broken in the future, as long as it's not broken now, as long as the quantum computer can't distinguish the challenges from random challenges right now, then the random bits that it gives us will still be fine, still be random. Okay? Uh, also, even the seed can be public, and yet the random bits that we get out can be private. Okay? And the random bits are sort of demonstrably fresh. They were not known to anyone, even to the quantum computer, before it re started receiving the challenges. OK, so the basic protocol, well, I, I sort of already sketched it. You know, classical client generates n qubit quantum circuits pseudo randomly, mimicking a random ensemble. For each T, the you know, client sends the Tth circuit to the server, demands back a response, S sub T, in a very short time. In the honest case, the response is just a list of samples from this output distribution. Uh, then the client picks a small number of random iterations, again, using its small random seed. And for each of them, it checks whether you know, you know, the hog problem is being solved. And if it's being solved, then it takes these, um, all the outputs from the server and it feeds them into a randomness extractor, which is just a classical tool for taking a bunch of bits with some entropy in them and getting a string, which is you know, a constant fraction as long, but which is nearly perfectly random. Okay? For example, the GUV extractor. Okay, and the main result basically says that under some suitable hardness assumptions that I won't have time to go into, that you know that this works, that it sort of generates actually order of n new bits of what's called min entropy in every round that you that you do this, uh, uh, min entropy being this thing here. Okay, the hard, you know it, it's with some effort one can show this for any one round. The much harder part is to show that the randomness actually accumulates from one round to the next. Uh, so I wanted to mention that there is a very you know different approach to getting certified randomness from a quantum computer. Uh, in a beautiful recent paper by uh, uh, Zvika Brakursky et al. I think all five of these people are in Berkeley right now, although only four of them are in the room. Uh, 
And uh, so, so, so what they have is a way to generate certified random bits with a quantum computer, assuming the quantum hardness of breaking lattice-based cryptography. And uh, I would go over their scheme if I had time, uh, which uh, unfortunately I don't. Maybe there will be a talk about it later. But, uh, uh, um, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful scheme. But it does, uh, you know, and a, it, it gets a huge advantage over my scheme, which is they actually give a polynomial time classical algorithm to verify the results of the thing, right? Um, I'm not able to get that with my approach. Uh, the advantage of my approach is that you can do it with a near-term device, you know, whereas this one seems to require, you know, uh, at least on the order of a thousand qubits and, you know, probably some sort of error correction if you were to implement it. Okay. Okay, so there are many exciting future directions. Uh, can we get quantum supremacy and certified randomness under more standard and less boutique complexity assumptions? Uh, can we get po polytime classical verification of random bits and NISC implementability, you know, at the same time in the same scheme? Uh, can we get more and more certified random bits by just sampling with the same quantum circuit over and over? That would have huge advantages in terms of the bit rate, and it would remove the need for the pseudo-random generator, but I'm unable to prove the security of this. Uh, can, you know, and then what about adversaries that are even entangled with the quantum computer? Okay, so conclusions, we might be close to, you know, quantum supremacy experiments. We can say non-trivial things about the hardness of simulating them classically. We'd like to be able to say more. Uh, certified randomness generation is possibly the most plausible application, at least that I can think of, of very near-term quantum computers. Uh, the application actually requires sampling problems, right? A problem with a definite answer like factoring is useless for this purpose. Uh, we can, not only can we do it with, you know, 50 to 70 qubits, we don't want more than that. Right? And we can fully exploit sort of whatever degrees of freedom are in the hardware we have. So I feel like with this application, all the weaknesses of sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments somehow get converted into strengths. All right, let me stop there. Thank you. Yeah, so in the um, generating random number uh, yeah. scheme, yeah. Verification comes from seeing if the uh, some random selection of your random bits actually passes this HOG test. Is that yeah, right? that's right. But to, uh, don't you need to actually classically sample from the distribution to come up with this test list, or can you give a uh, circuit? Can you already tell, tell yeah, me? Yeah. Well, well. So, so again, I assume that you have a small number of seed random bits. Okay. We, you use the seed for three purposes. One is to generate the challenges. One is to choose which challenges to verify. And the third is that you need a seed to do the randomness extractor. Okay? So you need a small random seed to get the thing started. But then once you have that, this scheme can give you an exponential expansion in the number of random bits that you have. So the seed also determines what the test is that you're going to do on the yeah. new Right. Okay. Yeah. Can I explain what happened with Alibaba so you can quit using the 70 qubit number? Uh, okay. So it's very simple. In our calculations, we take about, let's say, 100,000 data points mm -hmm. per second. Yep. And then you have to run through 100,000 points to get the probability. Uh -huh. And on a million cores uh, in you know, a few days or weeks or something, mm -hmm. that gives you around 48 or something. Mm -hmm. What Alibaba did. Mm -hmm. They assume they're only going to compute one yeah. sample. Mm -hmm. And one is a lot smaller than 100,000, yeah. so then you can have a much bigger depth. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, that has nothing to do with the experiment. Yeah. So if you define the problem to be easier, it's going to look yeah. better. Yeah, OK. Uh, I, I, I do agree. One is smaller than 100,000 by a constant factor. Uh, we can, you know, I, I mean, at least one author of the paper is here, so maybe in the uh, discussion this afternoon we can. Yeah, Greg. You you had this divide and conquer algorithm. Yes. As an alternative to path summation, the mm -hmm. dynamic algorithm from one end to the other. Yep. So, um, so this is actually of general interest for evaluating tensor networks rather than just for this thing. Okay. Right. Yeah, probably. Okay. <laughs> uh, and now my question, but you said it. 
So the trade-off is you usually suggest a trade-off curve mm -hmm. rather than an alternative among three algorithms. Uh, yeah. Well, I did, I did, I did at, least, at least verbally, I told you what the curve looks like, okay? I said, for, <laughs> you start with the Schrodinger algorithm, for every halving of memory usage, multiply the running time by a factor of D, B, D being the depth. Okay. All right, so I told you. Right. I think we'll save the rest of the discussion. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.